Hi, my name's Andy and this is a crazy video where I will teach you template metaprogramming, hopefully in under 20 minutes, uh, uh, even if you don't know what C++ templates are. Uh, I'll even explain what template metaprogramming is and uh, that it has an over-intimidating name. Okay, so I'm going to talk about what C++ templates are, how they're not Java generics, what the syntax looks like. Then I'm going to teach you straight away some template metaprogramming where we calculate um, uh, the, uh, uh, a PAL function. We write a PAL function that runs at compile time in the C++ compiler and just puts the answer into your source code. And then we'll do something a bit harder, which is uh, calculating Fibonacci. Um, honestly, this stuff is used for some really cool stuff um, that is genuinely useful. Uh, nothing in this video is useful. Um, but it is, you know, cool, and it's template metaprogramming, which sounds really, really hard. Okay, so what is a C++ template? Well, a C++ template is something that allows you to write one piece of code that works um, with multiple types. So, for example, we have a, a class here called MyList, which is actually a class template. The way we make a class out of it is we provide these diagonal brackets int. So now we're saying make a list of int. Uh, and call that list A, in C++ that actually makes a list. Uh, if you're used to Java, that looks weird. Uh, and then we can call add on A, because the my list template has an add function, uh, an add method uh, on it. And if you pass in uh, three, that's okay, because you, this is not just a my list, this is a my list of ints, so the add method takes ints. Uh, if you try and add foo to my list, that's uh, a compile error because foo is not an int. And this is not just a my list, this is a my list of int. Okay, so if you've seen Java generics uh, with the diagonal brackets that look pretty similar, uh, you may think that this is like Java generics. Um, it allows you to do stuff like on the previous page, which Java generics also allows you to do stuff like that, but it's a very different thing. Um, in Java, all that happens is all your generics get stripped out by the compiler and you're actually working with um, instances of the class object and the, uh, the compiled code has no idea what type your code has. Only, the, only during the compilation process does that type get checked. After that, you're just working with raw objects. That's not how it works. With C++ templates, um, you're getting two copies of your code or uh, multiple copies of your code, one for each type that you instantiate um, a class template for. Uh, so the name template is actually quite useful here. It's basically printing uh, versions of your class template uh, for each type that you want. So that my my list of int is actually a new a new class. It's emitted by the compiler into your um, into the code that then gets turned to machine code. Uh, also, uh, C++ templates are not limited only to uh, uh, types or classes, like in, uh, Java generics only allow um, uh, classes, they don't allow things like int, you have to use integer. Um, well, in C++ templates you can do anything you like, so if you want to make um, an adder that adds 3, when you call its do it method, you can make an adder and put that number 3 in the diagonal brackets, and make an instance of it, that instance we're calling add3. Then when you call the do it method on add3 and pass in a 2, it adds 3 to 2 and returns 5. So that little program there prints out 5. Um, so basically, at compile time, you're specifying a number uh, that's going to be part of your adder, uh, uh, this instantiation of your adder class template. So that name add3 reflects the fact that this is not just an adder of anything, this is an adder of 3. Still with me? Okay, so the other cool thing that C++ templates does is specialization. Uh, and that's really cool. And that's what allows us to do uh, this stuff. Um, so let's have a look at what it is. So, if we have a class which is templated, so this, this class, this is how we declare a templated class. So the last few slides we've seen how you use them. So this is how you would declare the, that adder class we just saw. It has a do it method that takes in an int. Um, but as part of the class definition, um, or the uh, class template definition, 
before the word class, we have the word template, and between diagonal brackets, we, uh, what it's templated on. So int there is the type of thing it is. So we do say what type we're expecting. And often that will say type name or class because we're often we're templating on classes. But in this case, it says int because we're going to, um, in order to use the adder class, you have to say what number is going to get added inside that do it method. Um, and we're calling the, num uh, the number that's going to get added uh, to add. And the naming convention for uh, compile time, things like this, is that they start with a capital. Often they're a single letter, but when you're doing complicated stuff, you need to give them a proper name, so I've called it to add. So this is the declaration of the class. As you can see, there's no definition of the method, but we'll get to that. Here's the definition of the method. Um, so this is actually what happens when you call do it. And this is uh, the C++ way of providing a definition of a method. Um, but it's templated on this to add uh, value. So the as you can see, the definition of this method is very straightforward. It, it returns uh, this compile time thing to add plus this run time thing x. So the assembly language for this will come out as return x plus, uh, 3 plus x or 5 plus x or whatever you um, passed in as your type for your adder class. And if you've made an adder of 3 and also an adder of 7, there'll be two copies of that in your assembly language uh, with two different implementations. Okay, let's move me out of the way. In fact, let's get rid of me for a bit. Okay, so uh, how does specialization work? That was the bit that I said was cool, wasn't it? So for, at the moment we've got um, uh, we've got a class which can add uh, three or five or whatever. But what if we wanted to do something special? Um, if you're making an adder that adds zero, so we can optimize in this case, can't we? So if you want to specialize, you have all the stuff that we've already seen, and then you have also have this. So template bracket bracket means um, we're specializing. Uh, and there are, there are no template parameters left, so this is um, this is a sort of a concrete class, not a template anymore because there's nothing left. And what we and then the class adder bracket zero there says um, what we're doing is uh, specializing for the case where you're making an adder and you passed in zero. So in this case, you won't get the code we saw on the previous slide. You'll get this code instead. So there's the declaration at the top, and then at the bottom there uh, is the definition of the do it method. Uh, in this specialized form, and what it does is it just returns x because adding zero is the same as returning x. Okay, so uh, let's use all that stuff to do something sort of kind of useful, uh, maybe not. Let's make a pow uh, function, but let's have that run at compile time and just put the answer into your source code instead of having to waste time at runtime doing it. So. Um, this is how we do something like that. We, um, our program here is just two lines of code that prints out two to the power sixteen and then three to the power three. Um, and the way it does that is it it makes an instance of the power class um, with two template parameters. Uh, on the first line, those two template parameters are two and sixteen. And on the second line, those template parameters are three and three. And then in order to get the answer out, just one of the uh, fiddly bits of the way the syntax of this kind of stuff works. We've made an instance of a class, uh, and then we, we get out a, um, uh, a member of that class. Uh, what's the right C++ word? Um, uh, I don't know. Anyway, we get out this thing called value out of the instance of the class. So that colon colon just means... Uh, get the value of the member variable value, um, uh, which is an int. So uh, that's why it'll print out those ints, 65536 and 27, which are the answers to those uh, uh, to the question, what is 2 to the 16? Okay, so that's how you use this power class. Let's see how we implement it. Um, uh, well, no, before we see how we implement let's have a little bit of proof. Uh, that this really is doing what I said it's doing. Make me a bit smaller. Um, so I've made two programs now. The first program is called h.cpp. 
uh, and it looks literally exactly like that. So it just prints out 65536 and 27. This C out and end all stuff, by the way, that's just how you print stuff in C++. Um, and then I've made another program called C.CPP, um, which, which is the program we've already been looking at, which calls this power function. And I'm going to compile both of those with G++ and pass in the minus S argument, which means give me uh, assembly language instead of compiling into an executable. So um, now we've got two .s files, h.s and c.s. When we diff them, uh, we can see the only difference between those two .s files uh, is the name of the cpp file that made them, which gets stuck in there um, by G++. So h.cpp and c.cpp, these two programs, one with hard-coded numbers in and one with this call to this uh, PAL thing, uh, both produce the exact same assembly language. So my point is, this stuff all runs at compile time, and at runtime there's no overhead for it. So you might think that it's useful, you might just think it's a bit cool. Okay, so here's how we implement PAL. Well, first of all, we declare um, a class template with two arguments, uh, B and E for, I think, base and exponent. Um, so base is the, uh, in 2 to 16, 2 is the base and 16 is the exponent. Um, and it has, all it has in it is one ver uh, one member variable called value, which is a const int, a static const int, in fact. Um, so it's a, yeah, it's a static member. Um, and what what value is, it's a static const, it's, so this is all happening at compile time. What it is, is b, which is the base, times something else. And that something else is actually an instantiation of another version of pow, um, with a base that's b again, but with an exponent that is e minus 1, so 1 less. So as you can see, as you if you keep multiplying, so long as we stop uh, when e gets too small, um, we keep multiplying, going through, instantiating versions of PAL until we get, uh, until we've multiplied it together enough times uh, that, that we've got the answer. So value will indeed be the value of 2 to 16 or whatever, so long as we stop when E gets too small. So um, how we do that is this. We specialize the, that uh, uh, class template declaration. Um, by saying, here's a version of PAL for when E is zero. So that first line template int B says, we're still templated on B, but we, um, we're we not going to provide E because E is going to be hard-coded to zero. At that point, when E is zero, um, this static const variable, static member variable is going to be just hard-coded to one. So that's how we stop. So the algorithm to calculate um, B to the E is um, in most cases, you do b times b to the e minus 1, but in the case where e is 0, you just return the answer 1. Between those two things, you get um, the answer you're looking for. Um, and, uh, and that's how you do it. So it's as simple as that. Uh, those two slides will give you the whole definition of your first piece of template metaprogramming. We've now written a template metaprogramming programming program that works. It gives you the power. It gives you uh, b to the e just by a recursive method. And you'll find with a lot, uh, with all the template metaprogramming, there's a lot of recursive code. So we could potentially, in normal code, we could have written a loop or something to calculate the power or done, you know, obviously we'd have called a library function. Um, but in template metaprogramming, you often have to use recursive solutions because um, you can't have variables, you can only have constants. So um, this value thing, uh, you can't have different values for it in the same class template. What you have to do is have different values for it in different class templates like we've got here. So that's why PAL depends on another version of PAL but with E one less. Okay, let's do something harder. So let's uh, define something called FIB which works in the following way. Uh, you can have a compile time uh, constant num uh, which is the number of Fibonacci's you want to calculate. And you can, at, at compile time, specify the size of an array of all the answers. And then when you uh, instantiate um, an instance of the fib uh, class template, templated on this compile time constant num, um, 
we've given it a name here CTF so that is an instance of it if you pass in this array where you want the answers to get put all the Fibonacci numbers um, up to four, up to the 40th one will be put into this array called answer in the constructor so the, it was uh, slightly odd here is that the actual Fibonacci numbers are calculated at compile time but they're put into the answer array at runtime um, because you can't, I can't make it uh, create an array at compile time in the way that I want it. Maybe someone can tell me how to do that. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is look at an ordinary implementation of Fibonacci, um, uh, which is a similar implementation to the one we're going to use in our template one. So this is a runtime implementation of Fibonacci. Um, and it basically uses the helper function called fibimpl, and then um, the real uh, function that is called from outside is down at the bottom. So fibimpl takes in um, an array of ints that it's going to put the answer into. It takes in uh, the last two Fibonacci numbers in the sequence and uh, what, what number Fibonacci number we've got to so far. That's the last argument. So n1 and n2 are the last two Fibonacci numbers. Um, we're going to calculate the next one. Um, or rather the next uh, the next quite a few because we're going to call ourselves recursively so um, for basically what we do is we check whether num has got down to minus one if it's got down to minus one we do nothing we finished uh, otherwise um, we put n1 into the answer array and then we call ourselves recursively um, and here's where the actual uh, Fibonacci formula you can see in our recursive call uh, we replace n1 and n2 by n2 and n1 plus n2. So if, uh, if you're familiar with the Fibonacci sequence, what that means is, uh, what that's doing is implementing the, the Fibonacci rule, which is that the next number is always the previous number plus the one before that. Uh, that's where that, that gets in here. So we're, this is a recursive implementation of Fibonacci, um, but we're only doing one recursive call. Um, that's why we're passing the last two numbers in. There's a kind of naive recursive implementation you could do um, where it recurses both to get both the previous number and the number before, but we don't like that. So this is the slightly less naive recursive implementation. So the main public function, all it does is kicks off uh, that fibimple recursive structure by passing in the first two numbers in the Fibonacci sequence, one and one, and um, the, number, the number more that you should calculate um, before you stop. So that is a recursive implementation of Fibonacci. I suggest pausing the video here, making sure you understand that. Um, and that now we'll do basically the same algorithm, but at compile time um, in our Fib class. So here is our um, class template for Fib. It takes one template parameter called num, um, and it has a constructor which takes in an array of int where it puts the answers. Um, and so that the top of the screen is the declaration, the bottom of the screen is the definition of that constructor. Uh, all it does is it uses fibimpl, and as you can see, it's similar to the the fib function we saw on the previous slide. It calls fibimpl, passing in the two the first two numbers in the sequence one and one, and then uh, takes one off the the number that are left to fill in, uh, and it constructs a instance of fibimpl one one num minus one, uh, gives it a name impl which we don't actually use for anything. Uh, and then it passes through the place where the answer should get put, which is this array of int. By the way, int star is the way we talk about an array of int in C++. If you're really that unfamiliar with C++, the, you're going to need to do a lot of pausing on this video and probably looking at a lot of other places. Uh, perhaps I shouldn't be. Perhaps I shouldn't be expecting you to be unfamiliar with C++ when you're learning C++ template metaprogramming. But I am because. Uh, there's too much mystery in there. It's not that bad. Okay, so here's fibimpl. So this is the um, compile time equivalent of that recursive function fibimpl that we saw earlier. Um, so it takes three template parameters. N1 and N2 are the last two things in the Fibonacci sequence. And num is the number of things left for us to do. Um, and fibimpl, this is the, the declaration at the top of the screen here. Fibimpl um, of N1, N2 and num is... Uh, overrides or is a subclass of another instantiation of fibimpl. So that's where the recursion is happening. 
So uh, the actual Fibonacci formula is happening after the colon here. So that colon means um, this is my um, superclass, and the superclass is n uh, is te uh, templated on n two, n one plus n two, and no, number one less. So basically, the next in the Fibonacci sequence. So as we saw, Fibimpl has a constructor which takes in um, this array of ints to fill in. So at the bottom of the screen, we've got a declaration of Fibimpl, which is a template specialization for when num is minus one. So we take in the last two um, Fibonacci numbers um, and the uh, uh, and in this case, we, what we're saying is there is a specialization of Fibimpl for when num is minus one. Otherwise, we'd go on uh, recursing forever based on that top definition. So, um, yeah, the specialization class at the bottom here, this declaration, has no base class. So the, the recursion of base classes stops here. Let's have a look at the definitions of these constructors. So the top one is the normal one, and the bottom one is the, uh, the base case where num is minus one. So let's look at the top one first. So what we're doing here is we're saying the constructor of fibimpl with n1, n2, and num. Um, the first thing we do uh, after the colon is call the constructor of our base class, which is fibimpl n2, n1, plus n2, and num minus 1. Notice there's a lot of repetition here, because this is the way C++ does it. You declare your class and you say what its base class is. And then in the constructor, you actually call the base class's constructor. And when your base class name is something very complicated, like fibimple n2, n1 plus n2, num minus 1, uh, that looks pretty verbose. And then the actual implementation, in, uh, in, in this case, of the constructor of our fibimple object, just puts an answer into the array. So um, the position in the array is being tracked by this num thing. And n1 is the um, the thing that we're putting into um, is the is the current number in the Fibonacci sequence. So we put it into there. And notice in the specialized case where num is minus one, uh, we're not putting anything into the array because um, we don't want to put something in at the minus one position in the array because basically we finished at that point. So what we're doing is going backwards through the array, um, starting at the right hand most. Um, uh, starting at the largest index and gradually recursing down until we get back to uh, minus one and minus one we don't put anything in the array because we've already done we've already put something in the first element of the array okay so let's uh, compile this um, so all that code is in this um, file called compile time fib.cpp let's compile it into assembly language and let's do a bit of gripping through uh, that assembly language and what we're doing is just grepping for some numbers. This 4181 and this uh, 1597 are basically things that I happen to know are in the Fibonacci numbers. Um, and as you can see, all I'm trying to prove by this slide is when you, uh, when you compile this program, the Fibonacci numbers are there in the assembly language of your program, in the machine code when it's compiled. Uh, so these things are not getting calculated at runtime. The only thing that's happening at runtime is they're getting inserted into the uh, array of answers. Right, and that's it. We've written a power function and a Fibonacci function, both of which run at compile time. Um, and before you started watching this video, you didn't know what a C++ template was. Well, I think probably hopefully you did, because if you really didn't know what a C++ template was, all of that horrific syntax is going to look pretty intimidating. But I suggest um, watching the video again um, or doing a little bit of basic what is how do you how do you do C++ and then going through again and you'll see that um, actually the concepts behind template metaprogramming are not that bad especially if you've done um, some programming in a language like one of the Lisps or something like that so that the recursive bit isn't new to you um, then all it is is horrific syntax uh, and impossible to debug um, uh, and therefore really cool. Um, and it, the, the real uh, um, value of this stuff is not that we can make a power function or something like that. If you look at uh, Andre Alexandrescu's book, Modern C++ Design, he uses similar techniques, um, much more advanced and much cooler, to um, build a whole load of useful classes that you um, uh, uh, that encapsulate concepts like, um, I don't know, like the visitor pattern or something like that, meaning that you 
Um, you don't have to write code every time you want that pattern. You just um, ask for it and it all gets instantiated at compile time. Um, I won't go on about it. Anyway, I, I highly recommend modern C++ design. Um, if you've got the patience to sit staring blankly at a page for a long time until you understand the code. Anyway, the point is, this uh, template metaprogramming stuff has some really, uh, really genuinely useful uses. Um, uh, you just haven't seen them in this video yet. What you've seen is um, a bit of playing around to get familiar with the ideas. Okay, uh, hopefully somewhere on your screen at the moment there's a subscribe button, or you can go to the YouTube channel at the top there. Uh, follow me on Twitter for uh, links to videos and blog posts. Uh, read my blog for stuff that I'm thinking about. Um, little bits of code I wrote, uh, and the videos go on there as well. Or go to artificialworlds.net uh, to have a look at my open source projects. And see you next time.